Hi, it's Mohamed here and welcome to the presentation of our project. In the quest to understand how the brain works, a central goal is to figure out how the neural activity that we observe in the brain come about. In the context of the visual sensory areas, not only the neurons respond to the sensory input, but also a considerable portion of their activity appears to be due to some unobserved internal processes often referred to as brain state, which result in a stimulus conditioned correlations among neurons. Now, to understand how the observed neural activity come about, it is crucial that we build models that account for all sources simultaneously, in this case the sensory input and brain state. However, while there has been great progress in developing models that account for these two sources, for the most part they have been developed independent of each other. On the one hand, we have deep neural network models that do a great job predicting a stimulus-driven activity, but they often ignore the stimulus-conditioned correlations among neurons, mainly due to their choice of loss function. On the other hand, we have many latent variable models that account for complex latent dynamics or complex mappings from latent space to neural space, but when it comes to the stimulus, they either ignore the stimulus or use simple stimuli, and when they do have a stimulus, they use simple models of the stimulus-driven variations, and they also often require responses to repeated presentations of the same stimulus. Our goal here was to close this gap by building a model that accurately accounts for the variability due to a stimulus and at the same time learns the stimulus condition correlations among neurons. Moreover, we want the model to be easily trainable via common gradient-based optimization algorithms, ideally without the need for responses to repeated presentations of the same stimulus, and importantly, we want the model to generalize and generate responses to novel stimuli. But before we talk about the model, let me briefly tell you about the data that we use in the project. We are recording neural activity via two-photon calcium imaging while the mouse is running on a treadmill and looking at natural images. In one recording session, we show about 6,000 natural images in total, and we also record behavior variables such as pupil dilation simultaneously. In this project, we use two such recordings, which I would refer to as a scan one and a scan two, and here you see a plot of the cortical position of recorded neurons. Each scan has two areas, and per area we use around 1,000 neurons. Now let's talk about the model and recall the goals that we said earlier. Our goal was to create a model that accurately accounts for the variability due to a stimulus and at the same time learns the stimulus condition correlations among neurons. To learn dependencies among neurons, we use a simple latent variable model called fact analysis model. Fact analysis model assumes that the observations V are generated from a mean value D plus the effect of some low dimensional latent variable Z plus some noise. The model makes two simplifying assumptions. One is that the latent variables are distributed according to a standard normal distribution, and the other one is that the noise is coming from a normal distribution with mean zero and a diagonal covariance matrix. With these assumptions, we can rewrite the fact analysis model as a probabilistic model of the observations V, where we assume V comes from a normal distribution with mean D and a covariance matrix CC transpose plus psi. However, neural responses are rarely Gaussian distributed. So to be able to use the fact analysis model, we need to transform the responses such that they can be captured more easily by a Gaussian distribution. To achieve this, fixed transformations such as a square root function have been used in the past. However, here we allow this transformation to be more flexible than the previous ones in two aspects. One is that we allow it to be learned, and two, we allow it to be neuron-specific because the transformation applied to one neuron may not be applicable to others. And finally, we model the effect of the stimulus on the response distribution by inferring the mean of the fact analysis model as a function of the stimulus, where the function is modeled via a deep convolutional neural network. One last step is to compute the probability over neural responses instead of the transformed responses. To do that, we need to add one additional term to the equation, which is the absolute determinant of the Jacobian of the transformation so that we account for the scaling of the probability density as a result of the transformation. With that, we have our complete objective function, which we use to train the model. Because the model combines invertible transformation and factor analysis, we call it flow-based factor analysis model, in short, flow FA. There is one additional twist which we introduce in our model to account for some characteristics of the calcium response distribution. And that characteristic is that responses recorded via two-photon calcium imaging often have a peak at zero, resulting in a zero inflated distribution. This is a potential problem for the flow of a model because the model would likely be biased towards this peak and provide a poor fit to the distribution, especially for the positive responses.
There has been some recent modeling work that tries to address this by taking a mixture modeling approach. So if you imagine a zero inflated distribution, the idea is to split the responses into zero responses and positive responses, and then the zero responses are modeled via a uniform distribution and the positive responses via a gamma distribution. As a result, the model is called zero inflated gamma. Importantly, these two distributions are separated at the zero threshold and are not overlapping. The approach that we take in addressing the zero inflation is very similar, but instead of the gamma distribution, we use the flow FA. And this allows us to preserve all the properties of the flow FA model while accounting for the zero inflation at the same time. With this modification, our objective function changes from the one we had before to this, where we have the uniform distribution for neurons that have responses below the threshold, and for neurons um, that have responses above the threshold, we use the flow of a model where we can learn the dependency structure among the corresponding neurons. We call the model zero inflated flow based fact analysis, in short, ZIFA. To test the model, the first thing we did was to see if it can recover ground truth transformation. So we sampled transformed responses for 100 neurons from a Gaussian distribution with known parameters, and then we transformed them into simulated neural responses with a variety of transformations. Here you can see some examples of the response distribution generated using these transformations. Once we generated the simulated responses, we then fitted models on the simulated data with different transformations. More specifically, we fitted models with identity, square root, ANSCOM, and flow transformation. So the first three are fixed, and the flow is learnable. To evaluate how well the models fit the data, we computed the KL divergence between the fitted model and the ground truth model. Looking at the results, we see that the flow-based model performs well for all transformations used for data generation, and also the transformation function learned by the flow model closely matches the ground truth transformation as shown by the black dashed lines. Once we were confident that the model can learn a variety of transformation, we then applied it on neural responses. We compared our model against models that are also based on fact analysis but use a fixed transformation, as well as two control models of a stimulus-driven variability. One of them is Poisson, which is a very common model of neural activity, and the other one is zero inflated gamma, which I explained earlier. First, I'm going to show you how well each model captured the response distribution. So on the y-axis, we have the log likelihood, and on the x-axis, we have the number of latent dimensions in the model. Latent dimension of zero implies that the model assumes independence among neurons. In terms of the log likelihood, the ZIFA model outperforms all other models in capturing the response distribution for all number of latent dimensions. Importantly, higher latent dimensions result in a higher performing model which emphasizes on the importance of accounting for dependencies among neurons for more accurate models. We also looked at the correlation between the predicted firing rate and the recorded responses. And interestingly, we see that the ZIFA model performs a slightly worse compared to models with fixed transformation, which reflects that fitting models on likelihood does not necessarily yield optimal correlation. Nevertheless, with increasing latent dimensions, the correlation of the ZIFA model improves significantly beyond the control models. And here are the per neuron transformations learned by the models, which were quite different from the fixed transformations. Now that we have this model trained on neural responses, can we use it to gain some insight about the brain? Well, before answering that question, let me explain one last component of our model, which I haven't explained yet. Our image computable model is equipped with a readout mechanism that learns the receptive field location of each neuron. While the location can be defined as a parameter and be learned directly by optimization, from retinotopy, we know that neurons that are located close to each other on the cortex, their receptive fields are also close to each other in the visual field. So given that we do have the cortical location of the neurons, we can learn a function that maps the cortical location into the receptive field locations. We refer to this function as the readout position network. What we also know is that some areas have mirrored representation of the visual field while others don't. So the retinotopy of some visual areas would be flipped with respect to the others. Since here we have two areas per scan, we allow the readout position network to take on a nonlinear form so that it can potentially learn such flips from the data. So now let's go back to the question of how can we use this model as an analysis tool and learn something about the brain. <clears throat> 
First, let's see what kinds of information is provided to us, either by the model or from the data. We have the latent states that can be inferred from the model. We have behavior variables from the data. We have the effect of the latent states on neurons um, through the factor loading matrix C. We have cortical positions, receptive field positions from the model. And finally, we have the mapping between the cortical positions and the receptive field positions. So in the next few slides, I'm going to use a trained ZIFA model with three latent dimensions to show how the model can be potentially used as a tool to gain some insights about the brain. I want to start from the last one and show you how the mapping function can be a useful tool. Here we have the cortical positions from the data and the receptive field positions learned by the model. Now, because we know the mapping from the cortical positions to the receptive field positions, we can detect mirrored visual field representation simply by looking at the determinant of the Jacobian of the mapping function. Areas that have mirrored visual field representation would have a negative determinant shown in blue, and areas with non-mirrored representation would have a positive determinant shown in red. This allows the model to identify distinct visual areas only from the responses to natural images, and the areas identified by the model closely match the ones that have been identified experimentally. We also see that the mirrored or non-mirrored representation detected by our model also match the experimental results from the literature. Now let's take a look at the latent variables and their effect on the neurons. We quantified the effect of each latent dimension on the neurons simply by looking at the weights that map that dimension onto the neurons. First, we looked at whether the effect of the latent dimensions depend on the cortical position of the neurons. Here you see the weights corresponding to each latent dimensions color-coded on the cortical positions, and it seems that while the first dimension appears to have a more global effect on both visual areas, the second dimension has an opposite effect across two areas. We can also perform the same analysis on the receptive field positions. And here, for instance, we see that the third latent dimension has a differential effect spatially on each area. And finally, we can take a look at the inferred latent states and see whether they are related to any of the behavior variables, in our case, the pupil dilation. Here you see the fluctuations of the pupil dilation in black and the inferred latent states in red. Importantly, the latent dimensions are ordered based on the amount of shared variance that they account for in the responses. So the first dimension accounts for the most of the shared variance and so on. Looking at the results, we see that the second latent dimension seems to be highly correlated with the pupil dilation, but the first dimension, which explains most of the shared variance in the responses, is not correlated with the pupil dilation at all. Surprisingly, this observation was consistent not only across the two data sets, but also across models trained with different random seeds. So combined with the observation that this first dimension has a global effect on the visual areas, as we saw in the previous slide, the question is, what is this first dimension? However, answering that question was beyond the scope of this paper. So here is a summary of what I just talked about. First, I presented to you a model that captures two crucial sources of variability in neural activity, namely a stimulus-driven and a stimulus-conditioned variability. And at the same time, it accounts for the zero inflation commonly observed in calcium response distribution. I also showed that the model reliably recovers ground truth transformations and also captures the response distribution better than existing models. In terms of using the model as a tool, it can identify distinct visual areas quite accurately, and it enables the analysis of how inferred latent states relate to cortical positions, receptive field positions, or behavioral variables. Therefore, the model we present here not only is an accurate model of response distribution of visual sensory neurons, but it also proves to be a useful tool for gaining insight about how sensory input and brain state combined with the structural information might give rise to the neural activity. If you'd like to discuss further about the project, feel free to get in touch or meet me at the poster. Finally, I'd like to thank all the members of Scenes Lab and our sponsors for their support, and I'd like to thank you for listening.